So, Brian. Hey there, John. How we doing? Got the tie on. Thanks a lot, man. Uh, Looking somebody, good. Somebody had to bring a touch of class to this show. So, uh, you know, happy to <laughs> no start doubt. It in that regard. Um, no doubt. This is just a little bit of a seat of the pants Friday event. Um, I'm planning on doing more stuff this summer or so, but I really wanted to just go on tonight, had a cancellation on the calendar. And so approached a few people. If folks are like, Hey, this is a bit of a sausage fest. I do want to go on record as saying the first two people I invited were female. So, Hey, they had other plans. So you stuck with the traditional cast of characters, but, um, but no, um, Brian, I've been wanting to, I don't want to spoil our ESG show cause we're going to do a whole show right. about your your ESG right. findings but um, but I really did want to tag on to the microservices conversation for a moment do you want to just elaborate briefly on your comment on microservices integration challenges and and ESG in particular uh, do I have you said here do I have oh yeah yeah we can share a screen yep I think so yep. yeah uh, and I can pull up a slide hold on yeah can you see it? Oh, yeah, there we go. You got it's a slide right. up here. Yeah, so what I'm really trying to show, the challenge on ESG is there's that kind of pinkish box there, which is the way data flows in and around your firm. And it's the traditional kind of view of things from like an ERP system where you got data that's coming out of plants and distribution centers, whatever, and it flows uphill to World Intergalactic Headquarters. And that's really where the flow of information is for most companies, most systems. And I know, yes, they may have a transportation management system or a supply chain management product or even a CRM one on the value chain side. But they don't collect a lot of the elements that you see listed down below. Things like, uh, does that supplier or that supplier supplier pay a living wage? Do they use forced labor or prison labor? Do they offer child care? There's a whole bunch of elements that you want to track, and it comes from all over this horizontal band here, and there's very little of that information that's actually captured or available today. So when you think about all the systems you're going to want to tap into, it's more than just your production systems, but it's all the systems of all of your supply chain value chain partners. And so if you thought you had a a microservice problem of X size in your firm, blow it out over your supply chain value chain and you're probably looking at like 20X or 100X. I mean, there are some companies, some big multinationals, particularly the ones who sell like in consumer products, they may be talking of millions or tens of millions of participants in their chains. And do you have all the connections that can go get data from them? I doubt it. Yep. So, yep. You, yep. you guys are the first ones to actually see that slide. Thanks so. for that. Special preview. It's nice to know how, how easy that is to actually do now. And uh, we can actually do a slide deck on, and do it pretty smooth. That's pretty cool. Not well, that not that anyone wants to like view like a PowerPoint deck on a Friday afternoon, but I mean, it's no, nice I know, to know I that know. we could. No, no. Um, you know, our good friend, mutual friend, Mr. Uh, Dennis Howlett, one time he had, he and I were doing a WebEx together for somebody and it crapped out in the middle of the deal just as Den was coming on. And in a matter of seconds, I mean, literally under 10 seconds, I shared another a window on my screen and I started giving a kind of a presentation like his and then till he could reestablish connection and join the call a couple of minutes later. But uh, I think I kept the dead air time to under 10 seconds for sure. I'll bet he was in a great mood when he came back on too. <laughs> he, he was actually in a better mood than you might have thought, uh, but he was, he was fine. Wow. Okay. He handled it with grace. Nice. Uh, anyway. Um, our 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 our, our, our remote role model indeed role model for sure. So that was the um, to answer your point. That was kind of where I was coming at with this like microservices deal because um, I just don't think a lot of people fully appreciate just how many sources of information need to flow in to get a really good uh, idea of what their uh, environmental, social, and governance kind of footprint is. Um, it's also, you know, anyway, we'll save a lot of that for the show to come. How about that? Yeah, that seems to be kind of the overriding theme of the 
spring conference season from my perspective is the sense that, yeah, I mean, the, a, there was a lot of bluster around generative AI, but the sort of like common theme from a customer perspective is the sense that, that, that they're, they're essentially their data is not ready for the next gen stuff that they want to do with it. And no. so how do you close that gap? Because until you close that gap, there's just a major disconnect because you can't, you can't plug next generation tools into an architecture that has a shoddy data platform and expect to get a result. So it's funny, you guys are having this call right now while I'm trying to get my article together for Diginomica on the Canaxis show that I was at Nashville this week. And I was thinking of that exact point you're bringing up relative to that show, because there, Canaxis gets these really large, complex, global, multi-tiered, multi-faceted kind of supply chain type of customers, big consumer products companies, for example, big, big, big global manufacturers with complex products. And those folks, you know, they live and die by their ability to manage disruptions to their supply chain, no matter what causes them. So at one level, the attendees were at that show trying to find out a better way to align execution planning up around their supply chain and minimize disruption. But on the other end, they've all got this, um, um, the emissions piece in particular of, um, of ESG, uh, they're really focused on that as well. And they feel the time is running out for them to get stuff caught up. Related to that, I talked to some, I talked to a bunch of these folks. Uh, that was probably the coolest part of being about the, at that show was rubbing shoulders with so many of these giants in industry. And they were all confiding that, oh yeah, you know, you know, you could tell they're going to be lucky to get their hands just around the emissions piece of the environmental part of ESG uh, b because they're dealing with so much dynamism in their businesses. They're doing mergers, acquisitions, divestitures. Mm -hmm. They're having to reposition assets like distribution centers and warehouses. Uh, their supply chain is getting changed on a daily basis because today – you're using one supplier tomorrow. Well, you can't. You got to go with somebody else, and right. that just changes up all the the metrics on all this stuff. Um, one speaker, I asked her straight on in a um, uh, Q and A at a session uh, about how you know what are you going to do with all your plants because a lot of theirs were built like 50 years ago and. You don't have all the sensors and the IoT and all this other kind of technology to really get a crisp real-time or granular level information. And she just looked right at me and the rest of the audience. She goes, I know the problem, and the only way we're going to get there is to build factories of the future. You know, it basically, you know, the old things, the old plants aren't going to be able to carry the weight, I guess, of what's going to be required going forward. Mm. Anyway. Yeah, that, that was a cool show. Um, I, 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 and you would like this, John, because you hate overly scripted, uh, hand holding kind of content. Oh my God! Where, where customers, you know, have to stand on stage with a vendor representative who's going to say, "But you know what, John? Tell us why you chose the award-winning world's greatest piece of I don't know, supply chain software. You know? My, my favorite in those over-moderated sessions is the responses to the questions after the customer answers. That's amazing. Oh my God, that is fantastic. The customer will be like, well, you know, we're about a third of the way through the go live. We got two years to go. That's fantastic. That's amazing. And it's like, oh my God. Yeah. And the, anyway, the, anyway, to can access and prove upon that format, I hope. They oh, do. yeah. In fact, they let the customers just walk out on stage and talk. They didn't have. Oh, yeah. I love that. The, the mic handover where you just hand the mic to the customer and step off. I like that. Right. They did that. That's a good and format. In yeah. cases, some of the customer and they gave them ample time. They didn't try to give you know give everybody like all of three minutes to talk because if you let mm. a customer talk longer than that they might say something that isn't overly flattering you know no they'd let them go in some cases like 45 minutes to an hour wow cool. and uh some of the customers brought two and three other people from their firm with them to talk and uh man these these people had 
they had great content. I'm sure somebody worked with them just to make sure like the slides all hung together and they worked through the, you know, the, the stuff, but it wasn't that overly massaged, overly polished kind of stuff that just mm. uh, reeks of infomercial. It was exactly the opposite of that. And it was, you know, that was one part of that show. I thought you would have probably stood up and given somebody an award or at least a standing ovation for that. Uh, anyway. Yeah, no ahead. doubt. Isn't it, isn't it amazing? It doesn't actually take all that much. You just have to step out of the way and, uh, and let, let your customers do the talking. It's kind of go it, figure. It's a sh shocking, shocking idea. I know, but. Right. Well, if you've got confidence that you've built a market ready and value creating product, then you should be comfortable enough to step aside and let the customer do the talking. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the ones who feel they really have to control the message so much. Those are the ones that just sends up my, gets my spidey sense going. It makes me want to dig in and be a super cynical analyst and take them apart. Not that you've ever seen me do that. But anyway. Oh, no, no, that's never, I've never <laughs> seen that. Yeah, I don't, it surprises me how many vendors don't, don't really see that. Like, like I had a lot of times this spring where I interviewed customers and, and the interviews were really good. But for whatever reason, the vendor felt they needed to like have a babysitter sitting at the table, and and look, it's fine. I don't mind that. Like, but I don't think they realize how powerful it is when they just walk away and just say, "Hey, just have a one-on-one -on -one with our customer," you know. Mm -hmm. And you know, it it's just such a show of confidence that you know what, like we trust that ultimately this was a good project, and even if a few like rough edges come out, who cares? Like. We, we were successful and, you know, so anyway, I really love it when, when vendors kind of realize like, yeah, like, let's just let our customers do that. And to your point, I mean, you do have to do your homework and make sure that you're delivering, you know, well enough to make those stories shine. But at that point, just step out, let them, let them carry the flag for you. I know it's crazy, but whatever. Anyway. Well, and given the seniority of the people that spoke and the enormity of the organizations they come from, I'm quite confident these people have great public speaking skills and the vendor should just turn them loose, get out of their way and let them go. And that's what they did. So that worked out real well. It uh, is really interesting. It, it is really interesting, though, because I think this whole this this whole generative AI discussion that's been going on. Throughout the spring, I actually had a snarky strike through in my latest article because I said I described it as the generative AI conference season. And then I struck through the generative AI and put enterprise software because it just basically was like at times you wondered if you were at a generative AI show instead of like an enterprise software event. But um, I think there there's just a whole lot of problems. But one of the big ones was just like. This, this sort of idea that you're going to take this fancy thing, never mind if the generative AI is ready yet, but let's just say it is ready, and just plug it in, and now you go into hyperdrive, like warp speed, like, you know, like a, a, when the Millennium Falcon goes into, like, warp whatever, and it's like, well, but actually some of the most important data in the enterprise is not readily available to be accessed in that manner, and you know, manufacturers are a great example because they have, you know, talking to manufacturers like at the recent IFS show and stuff like they're they're really interested in AI technology. But at the same time, like they have a lot of old equipment that isn't yet on any kind of a central. It's essentially not communicating. And if it's not communicating, <laughs> then it can't be a part of the generative AI experience. It, it can't it can't be a part of things. And, you know, pretty much wherever you look, there is some form of data that isn't ready. And anyway, so hopefully what's going to happen is customers are going to take this as motivation to start tackling these problems and saying, well, why isn't it ready? You know, and, and, you know, and, and can I get it ready? Because, you know, we've been talking about this for years now. So maybe, maybe that'll be the one really good thing to come out of all this is customers realizing this, this shit's going to underperform when I plug it in. Anyway, whatever, we'll find out. Well, right now I'm amazed at how many people who have tried one little silly thing with like chat GPT, like fix my resume. And they're all now professed artificial intelligence experts. And the first people I knew that worked with AI and machine learning back in the uh, early 90s, maybe, they were still working with Lisp and other kinds of utilities. and 
this stuff still you I, just because somebody watched an episode of mash doesn't make you a surgeon and when I see all these armchair AI jocks want to lecture me, you know, in their podcast and post about how, you know, you know, how great the world's going to be now that uh, all this AI stuff's going to be out there. I just really wonder, like, I sure hope there's some accountability to, for these people in a couple of years when all the pipe dreams and the problems they glossed over and so forth come home mm. to roost because I want to be there wagging my finger at them and going you idiot you chumbalone what were you thinking when you did this um i mean we can all see that we're we're way overshot the normal peak on the hype cycle and we're due for a valley of despair a trough to come up at some point i just don't know what that what the most embarrassing screw up is going to be yet but i just feel it in my bones it's going to be spectacular absolutely spectacular yeah, it feels like <laughs> Richard Duffy's saying that AI experts are the new generation of crypto bros. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah, it, Touché, it, it Richard. <laughs> Good one. It, indeed. And yeah, I mean it's going to be an interesting time because I think that um you know, there is there this is obviously a cultural phenomenon in a way that you know my my big beef with the whole Web3 crypto metaverse thing that Richard's referring to is essentially it's a VC fantasy, like with, with niche audiences that someone decided this is the future for everyone. And the interesting thing about obviously the generative AI stuff is the broad adoption of the technology in various ways. Um, and, you know, and so that that forces us to talk about it, right? Because that's actually people actually using this stuff and has popularized this conversation. So we do have to have this, these conversations. And so what I decided to do is just dig deep into the technology, which is what I'm doing. And the, the deeper I dig, the more surprised I am at the limitations of this tech and, and that, the, and that they're not going to be overcome in, 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 in any time soon. It's not like, Oh, GPT four, GPT five is going to solve all of this. It's not how it's going to work. And I'm not going to get into all the technology architectural things right now. But to your point, I think one of the mistakes some companies are going to make here is they're going to use this as a headcount reduction exercise. And they're going to say, oh, well, we don't need a content team anymore. You know, we're just going to use this tool to pump out this mediocre crap. And they're going to find out like Cena did that, that, uh, that it takes, you know, it's embarrassing. And then you have to go through and do all the fact checks and fix all the, the stuff that's wrong. Um, so there's that scenario or the service scenario, right? We're going to get rid of this call center. You know, everything's going to get handled by these human-like bots that understand everything our customers want. So I think to your point, that's where some companies are really going to embarrass themselves. It's not so much going to be like, yeah, there will be like, oh, my proprietary, proprietary information got exposed. I mean, that's already happened. But it's going to be more like an overreach of like, oh, we can automate be, you know, we can automate the shit out of this and get rid of all these people. And what they're going to find is it's not that simple, but anyhow, that's what I think. Well, I share the cynicism because, um, I don't know if you know this, John, but I'm left-handed and lefties think differently and use different parts of their brain than the rest of the general population. So when a chat bot ever pops up on my computer, I just don't seem to be able to communicate with them or communicate well with them. I mean, I could ask a question like, how's the weather outside? And I get a question about like, Brian, cloud applications were designed for high performance computing. And I'm like, what the hell does that have to do with the weather? Uh, I, I, I think whether it's the machine learning or whether some of the, like the old chat bots, which were programmatically, you know, created or structured by people, there's there's so much room for things to fail and I, I don't see the mechanisms yet uh, other than people tell me oh but you just got to retrain it you got to do this you got to do that and I, I keep asking you know questions like how who's going to find all the drop-off points and the screw-ups and the failures I don't see that kind of technology on the horizon which makes me wonder you know is this stuff 
are, aren't we still talking about being possibly years away from seeing something that can go into a real production mode that actually solves a really decent problem? You know, I mean, yeah, you know, something rinky dink, maybe, but even then, you know, I have problems when chatbots come up for just something simple, like I want to cancel my, um, Mm. Uh, you know, car stereo service, streaming service. And, it, you know, and I know some of these clowns, they diabolically cr make it, they make it intentionally difficult for you to ever cancel anything. Uh-oh, Richard's back in. Richard says he's seen a few partners soft launch support offerings driven by ChatGPT, but it's just ChatGPT with a predefined syntax to limit the results to the product and a customer with their own ChatGPT account can get the same result. So yeah, like I, I think that's kind of what I'm getting at because I've, I've spent the whole spring looking into these use cases. And I will say that I've, I've seen some that I think show some level of promise, but so, so I think, um, Hyam Park of, of Amalgam Insights wrote a really good post about this. And he, he, he was talking about the enterprise application of of generative AI, and he referred to it as instant mediocrity. And, and at first you think, well, that's that's the biggest insult you can ever level against a technology. But when you think about it, it's not really in the sense that it does have implications because sometimes something that's mediocre is actually good enough for certain purposes in the enterprise. So like to take, for example, like, um, you know, you, you got to upload 20,000 product descriptions every day on your, your website. Well, those don't, necessarily have to be the, it's not like lyrical poetry. It's like job, you know, product descriptions or job descriptions could be similar. Like sometimes the fact that you can do it instantly and quickly, whereas a human might take a week to put it something out kind of mediocre. So now you can do it much faster. That does have implications. But I thought it was interesting because in the end he said, think of it like an intern. And that's where I really had a problem with this post because I've had interns and the best interns actually come up with creative ideas at times they can actually solve problems and you can give them something and it's not just a task but it's a it's a responsibility around that task like you you would say like you know create a, a, a job description for this new position go out post it review some resumes it's like it's it's a more complicated scenario so so describing generative AI as an intern or a virtual assistant is really not accurate. It's really more outsourcing specific tasks. It's, it, the best analogy might be some form of gig economy uh, outsourcer that's like right at your fingertips where you could say, uh, summarize these points for me and boom, you get your task back. But you're still managing the task. That's the point. There, it, It's not some revolution in productivity because you still have to manage it. And anyone who manages anything knows that managing stuff is where the time consuming part is, you know, ultimately you, you're the one it's the human in the loop scenarios. You, you really can't remove humans from a lot of these loops. I'm not sure Brian was fussing with his technology. So Brian's tech technically out of the, uh, out of the conversation. If anyone uh, in the chat wants to comment for a moment, that's fine. Uh, I'll probably be wrapping up in like 10 minutes. Um, Brian's coming back. Yo, Brian. Yeah, I have you no back? idea where I went. I think an AI bot took me off of the uh, off the street. Yeah. Yard. So right. anyway, anyway, just wrapping that up, Brian. I I think there's a big dif difference between like I think an intern is way too high a compliment for these technologies. I know what Park was trying to do. He was trying to imply that it's a lower lower skilled individual, but actually, I told him on Twitter that it's an insult to some of the best interns I've had who are like. <laughs> You know, you, you you could set an intern loose on a project and it might not be perfect, but they would actually complete the entire project. You know, that's not what these technologies do. They don't have that ability. Oh, and an intern can even do something customer facing and like make the customer happy at times. So um, Richard says it's positioned as innovation, but it's not. And for SME customers, they've seen the application of this tech to answer relatively simple questions to give the customer an answer that, uh, you know, without paying someone for a support contract. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it is interesting, too, because you think about, like, oh, and they don't have to wait a long time for an answer, which is exactly the point around instant mediocrity, right? Like, you can get stuff in an instant. And at times, like, so if someone lacks, um, you know, great medical care or great legal counsel, 
maybe you know this technology gives them access to some things, but there's a buyer beware component to that as well. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of that old definition of um, uh, the difference between was it horseshoes and uh, that horseshoes and hand grenades, you know, are two things where close enough is good enough. And that's kind of really where we are with some of the yep. uh, AI, generative AI kind of tools today. Um, somebody's going to write that down and tweet it. I can feel that coming already. Oh, it, yeah. <laughs> Brian just advocated for the use of hand grenades in certain situations. <laughs> anyway, uh, aside from the, you mean aside from the hand grenades that you lob at vendors during analyst sessions? Yeah, those count. <laughs> you know, one vendor actually uh, came up and reminded me of um, how I can. Oh, let's say cut to the bone, you know, in like five words, the first five words of a question, uh, you know, to an executive. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm good. At, I'm good with that. Yeah. Richard says, Richard says it's mediocre, but in a lot of scenarios, it's correct. And Richard, that is true. And, you know, I mean, in, in a lot of cases, you get what you need. But the problem is that there are some cases where you can't afford to be wrong. And um, I'll give you an illustration of this, Richard, to tell you exactly what I'm talking about. Hi, Tracy. Welcome back. Nice to see you in the chat. Yes, we are still live. This proves it. Looking forward to your salty commentary as we get back onto the video uh, horse this summer. I'll try to be doing this on Friday afternoons. Not every Friday, but frequently. Uh, Richard, so let me just explain to you kind of like how I look at this from, from an accuracy perspective, because generative AI is not going to get to 100% accuracy. That's not what it does, because it, it doesn't understand what it's doing. It, it's predicting the next word. So that's how the technology is based. But maybe it can get, in some cases, 90, 95, 97%. So I was having some debates with some vendors, because I noticed one particular vendor described this as a revolution in one-to-one -one personalization. And so I pulled them aside and I said, no, like that's, that's not correct. And, and I asked for clarification. And when we discussed it further, where we got to was that actually, no, this is more of an advancement in segmentation than true one to one. So let me give you an example of that. So for example, let's say a salesperson wants to use generative AI to write more personalized emails to prospects. The problem is that even with a human in the loop scenario, you could miss some very important details on an email that could have really damaging effects to a VIP customer. So for example, you sent you, you have generative AI send an email to a customer that says, uh, you know, we're really looking forward to seeing you and your wife again at the resort next month. And it turns out that this person's wife is has cancer or even worse, has died or whatever. You can't walk that kind of pseudo personalization back. That has a damaging effect. And so essentially that's an overreach to fantasize that these machines can now conduct one-to-one -one relationship building. They can't do that, at least not if you have VIP customers like that, because the risk is too great that something would get screwed up. And unlike like, like some factual error, like spotting something like that is going to be really difficult for a human to spot. It's just going to hit send or go out automatically. But this notion of having more advanced segments makes a lot of sense. And this technology is going to be very good at especially if your data is updated properly, it's going to be very good at identifying certain segments and certain triggers and getting out messages to people in that group. So essentially, you just have to be wary of this overreach of the technology. It's not that the technology doesn't have use cases. It's just an overreach. So uh, Richard says the disclaimers always have to be there. As you said, absolutely. And, and you have to find the proper use cases for it. Uh, Tracy said, don't you kind of have a have a person in one-to-one -one personalization? Well, yes, that's kind of what I feel. And and I thought it was interesting that the vendor in question kind of walked back. They walked the language back. And and it's not like they, they didn't apologize for what they said or anything, but they said, yeah, they took it on, on board and they said, in the future, we'll talk more about advanced segmentation. I said, thank you, because one-to-one -one personalization is really, that's a misleading description of what this tool is going to be good at, in my opinion. I mean, Let's see. I mean, if if, if y'all want to take on the challenge and try to send me some one to one emails written by an AI, let go for it. Let's see how let's see how you do. I'm really skeptical. And believe me, I would love to sick an AI on my inbox. I mean, that nothing would make me I mean, I don't know about you, Brian, but if I could just get a little update from my assistant saying, You had one hundred email messages today. I have responded to all of them. Your inbox is at zero. 
that would be like the greatest friggin' day of my life. Like, I'm not no, going to fight no, that. No, no, no. That would be the worst day of my life because they're all from uh, schlocky PR firms who want to pitch me a briefing. And the worst thing that could happen is some AI tool booking up my schedule with demos of products that I can't spell and have no interest in whatsoever. Uh, so, no, I don't, you know, I'm not looking for that. That is not nirvana for me. Uh, plus, I already get enough emails from people that misspell my first name. I'm tired of being brain or Brian with a Y or Byron. Uh, you know, I don't need all those. And a real life example, uh, let me put this out there. Uh, we had a, a distant relative pass away recently. And um, what's been fascinating is all these law firms have been trying to reach out to other family members uh, and they're combing all these public databases that an AI tool oh would be trained on. God. And I, you, I know you're already starting to feel the skin crawl. And so oh. these, uh, you know, these ambulance chasing types, they've been calling and emailing and sent, some sent blind FedEx packets our way. And uh, it's fascinating how, number one, they can't find me for some reason. I do a good job of hiding my tracks, I guess, on the Internet. But um, they have found lots of dead relatives and have been mailing them a lot of stuff. And um, uh, but the inexactitudes of what's going on are incredible because depending on the source, they don't know if somebody's alive or dead. They don't know where they live. They don't know what state right. they're in, how many times they've moved. Did they have any children or not? They, there's so many things they don't know because there's so much missing, well, out of date information on the internet. And it's not date and time stamped. It's not effective date driven. It's not, it's not cleaned up or taken care of, you know, it's not. So if you're going to rely on that kind of stuff, Boy, you're on some, you're standing in quicksand. And to think that you're going to personalize something, well, man, when I get those things that are allegedly are personalized to me and they've got the wrong name on there, I mean, not just misspelled, I mean, completely wrong, then I just die laughing because that person hasn't lived at this house in 12 or 15 years. You, you, your anecdote reminded me of one of my favorite scenes in. In, in cinema, which is the beginning of the verdict with Paul Newman, where he's crashed that funeral. He's like at the low end of his career as a lawyer. And he's like handing out his business card at a funeral. It's just like, Oh my God. I, I, I don't always feel a hundred percent about my work every day, but I feel way better than that. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, and Richard, you know, you're right about you're you're right about this notion that, that, you know, that low level service bot stuff um, you say you've seen ChatGPT train itself from better knowledge bases, give a really quick and accurate result, uh, which is why I call ChatGPT a plagiarism engine. But you know, to to the point there, like like I I do think that's that that type of low level service is a pretty good use case for for bots, especially if bots have been fed the right information. But the problem, of course, is that you have to design it properly because it's not a one size fits all. Like even accurate information won't necessarily solve my particular problem and the more complex an enterprise is the more likely it is that an out-of-the-box answer won't fit the use case that you're dealing with so part of it has you have to have an escalation procedure which is like where i believe companies are going to get into trouble around this technology because they're going to think we can do a headcount reduction here and they're not going to look at it like how can we use this to invest more heavily in more sophisticated support personnel to support the 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 efficiencies we get from dealing with more low level queries those are the kinds of conversations that make sense to me but i think cu customers are going to abuse these tools we're already seeing it like barb mosher zinc wrote a piece on digenomica about a couple of people uh, from a company that were like can we fire our content team you know and it's like well no you can't fire your friggin content team well let me put it this way if your content team writes crap that bad then yeah you should fire them anyway probably but not because of chat gpt just because your content team sucks if your content team's any good you can't fire them for this tool i mean that's ridiculous so john anyone watching this at whatever time i'd like you to go and look up the johnny cash song one part at a time 
uh, because he talks about how he, he was working in a GM plant building a Cadillacs and he would steal one major component, at, you know, every year or so. And he was taken home and he was building a car. Now, we all know the car models change over time. And there's a picture on the cover of the most god awful looking car you've ever seen that was built one one part at a time or one piece at a time, something like that. And I think about that when I think about the information that gets pulled together for these AI utilities. You know, they're going to recommend something based on what they've learned across all kinds of different responses. And when they when they amalgamate this stuff, they may actually create a Frankenstein response that is that bears no reality of what you actually may encounter out there. And you're going to get the Johnny Cash one part of Tom Carr for an answer when you really need something very focused on your particular. Uh oh. Brian Tracy gets your reference. She says she doesn't have to look that up. She says maybe uh, she's old, but she grew up on that stuff. So, oh, oh, we got a special guest. Yes, we have See, Roxy, the Wonder German Shepherd, who's wondering, yep. when am I getting dinner? And uh, I know that's why she came in to visit me. She had butted the door into my office. Well, soon, because we're going to wrap in a couple. But but it's good to know that security is always a part of these conversations. In this case, security has four legs, but it's still security, so that's good. Yeah, she'll... Uh... I tell you, if you have a pizza crust in your hand, you don't have a hand anymore. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that's the security we've got. Richard says agree, which is why uninformed. He's referring to my service conversation. Agreed, which is why uninformed execs shouldn't be allowed to make decisions based on this. They have to see it and use it for themselves, <clears throat> as if that's going to happen. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I'm, so I'm glad somebody caught the Johnny Cash reference. That that made the whole appearance on here worthwhile. So thanks for that. Yeah, Tracy, no doubt, no doubt, Tracy walks the line. <laughs> so uh, just, just as real long quick. As she wasn't singing the Folsom Prison Blues when she was doing it, but anyway. Um, just real quick, just to, Brian, we'll get your reactions to this, but um, just before we wrap, I just want to go through my most recent post on SAP customers reacting to generative AI. Uh and I talk about highlights from the spring generative AI conference season. Yeah, that was a cynical strike through on my part. <laughs> we heard way too much generative AI happy talk from the keynote stage. But this is categorically different than the blockchains or magical keynotes from five years back. Generative AI is surging on the backs of consumer adoption, not to mention the sharp rise in shadow generative AI within enterprise walls. There was some stat that said like 90% of marketers are toying with this and using it a risky endeavor that companies must get a handle on. And and then I go on and say, but we ran into trouble, and I want to just run through this list. The generative AI risk factors were mostly downplayed, but that's a top question of any CIO or CFO wants answered. The gap between customer priorities and vendors' AI talking points was often quite large. Other areas of tangible progress, such as the impact of robotics on the shop floor, recommendation engines on e-commerce, and automation and finance missed out on being showcased, even though they are much more mature and therefore applicable at this moment. And then I said enterprise vendors have a terrific opportunity to address some of generative AI's shortcomings around data privacy, hallucinations, government, reinforcement, learning, and explainability. But more time is needed, and that wasn't always clear from the enthusiasm of the keynote stage. Brian, your comments. With uh, one notable exception, I've... Uh I would say that vendor enthusiasm is, uh, it's the com user conference, like, um, excite it's the most exciting thing at the user conference, except for the marching band first thing on day one morning. Uh, you know, it's, uh, oh, it's yeah, all you they love the, You love a good marching band, Brian. Come on, man. Uh, yeah, you know, because I I like nothing more than having bleeding eardrums, uh, you know, first thing in the morning, um, uh, or having some somebody with a bass drum standing right behind me, just beating the daylights out of that thing. Uh, anyway, m my reaction on your point is, um, oh God, I had a great thought. It was based up in the front part of your. Um, was it the bullet points or before? Uh, just before was the it, bullet points. Yeah. Just before the bullet points. 
Generative AI surging on the backs of consumer adoption, not to mention the sharp rise in shadow generative AI within enterprise walls, a risky invent- endeavor yeah, that companies yeah. must get a handle on. Yeah, let's talk about that. Uh, so I think the whole idea of shadow AI is, uh, you know, that's something you you could write multiple pieces on because I know it's just, it's coming in at all over the place. And, um, and you're seeing it on the external constituents of a company. Uh, you're seeing job seekers using these tools to, you know, polish up resumes and everything else. So it's there. And it's uh, and it's and it is in the shadows, and they're not very good tools to detect it. So we we've had an ar- we always have technology arms races, and for every measure there should be a countermeasure. And right now, no one's talking about any countermeasures to um, AI-driven kind of fraud. That's one. Number two is. Uh, I was fascinated several years ago, probably about 10 years ago, I studied uh, who's selling big data and where is this stuff coming from? Because this would, nowadays, this would be great stuff to train models on. And I was astonished to find out that in a lot of major companies, it's the chief marketing officer has been selling a lot of corporate uh, customer and other kind of data to third party firms because it's a way for them to bolster their budget without having to go to the uh, finance or capital committees to go get money. And it was, it was amazing how much of that was going on in companies. So we've never fully declared a victory on stopping Shadow's technology spend anywhere. It's still going on. And, okay, well, good. Richard, I'm glad some of them are starting to pop up. Richard's starting to see some AI detection tools start to pop up in his LinkedIn Twitter feeds. Yep. But I think we're, um, I have no doubt that that's going on. I just don't think they're at the same level of um, market awareness or penetration or even maturity as what we're seeing on the other side of things. Anyway, the bottom line is, I know there's all this spend. I know there's people selling data. I know people are going to be buying, you know, stuff on the sly and experimenting with it. And it's not going through the real channels it should. I know all of that's going on because I've seen this movie before. And it's going to happen again here in the AI space. That's my reaction to your point. Yeah. And and if you do a, a Google search on open AI uh, detection tools and write the word fail next to it, you'll see a bunch of headlines like uh, from the spring, OpenAI's new AI detector isn't great at detecting AI. I see one talking about uh, correctly identifies 26% of AI written text. I know there was also some examples in one of these articles on false positives, uh, which is obviously kind of one of the worst things you would want on that. And most, and then a TechCrunch article saying most sites claiming to catch AI written text fail spectacularly. So I, I think we are definitely going to need AI. We're going to need to sick AI onto AI, but it's not going to be anywhere near perfect. And, you know, so when we design these systems, we're not going to be able to trust the machines to regulate the machines in most cases. We're going to need to design human in the loop scenarios that appropriately catch. Uh, at least the the bulk of these types of gaffes and the more mission critical your systems are the more you're going to have to take a hard look at that and so you know that's that's part of the game here is to figure out where the use cases are now i'm happy to have that discussion i mean people and i think i'm really being really grouchy about this is because i'm interested in project success and i don't want to see companies getting hook line and sinker into these technologies before they're ready for prime time so that's where i'm coming from yeah, that's the Ernest and Julio, Ernest and Julio Gallo school of technology. We will never release an AI routine before it's time. So exactly. Yeah. Well, Brian, thanks for popping on and proving once again that you have a superior enterprise wardrobe to me and probably most of the people watching this. <laughs> yeah, yeah that that was the whole point of me coming on. Yeah, that absolutely, was, absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and you brought some good content too. So, so that's I mean, fashion and substances is, is really a you know what excellent I, combination. Oh, credit, it's not here. But I just got my new Whataburger long sleeve fishing shirt. Uh, I could have worn that on the call. Oh, um, next time maybe, maybe for the ESG. 
yeah, discussion. Shows, you can wear that big, on the back. But there's a big largemouth bass jumping out of the water, getting ready to bite into a water burger hamburger. I mean, you know, if that doesn't bring the fish into the boat by the sack loads, I don't know what else will. Um, anyway, a couple that, of comments. A couple of comments, real quick, on the chat. Uh, thanks to Richard and Tracy for keeping it lively. Uh, Tracy, at some point, I'd like to get you on the on the show at some point. So thanks for being such a regular and uh, spicing up the conversations. And then Richard also appreciate Richard. I got your message around other show content that I might not respond for a few days on that. Just, just, so you know, I'm trying to exhale a little bit from a vigorous show circuit and Richard's final comments. We have used it to generate some content frameworks for FAQs, which we then refine and add the personal expertise yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'll give you one sample use case I would like. I I have like a bunch of longer pieces. I'd love to stick a tool like this on those pieces and say, create me a you know a fifteen page slide deck based on the high points. I would take that. Of course, I would gut it and change it. But but that's because like for me, writing's easy and slide decks are hard. For other people, it's the reverse. So I think these tools have a way of filling in our shortcomings in, in areas where we're not as good, but I don't think they're, I, I would never be like, there's a huge difference between create a PowerPoint based on this article or series of articles versus do that and send it to my most important prospect. And that, and that's the part that it's not ready for yet. Um, Richard says, no problemo. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It stays salty and spicy. Absolutely. I mean... I mean, if you want an endorsement for those on your LinkedIn profile, I'll see what I can do. I'm not sure if LinkedIn will allow me to put those in there. If that'll help you at all, spice up the profile a little bit. We could try. <laughs> yeah, I. Um, yeah, let's see if you can get that by uh, LinkedIn on that one, um, John. See, now Richard says it's a great way to start on a blank page, and like, so for me, like that's not really an issue for me. And so like that, that's not a compelling use case. But like I said, I think it depends on the, the, the person and situation. You know, I had an argument on LinkedIn about a, with a CMO of a vendor that, that published a blog post written by um, chat GPT. And I thought it was, he was like, Oh, it was all authored by, I thought it was crap. I thought it was like the worst piece of branded horse manure I'd seen in a long time. And so it really depends on like what you do with that content and then what your criteria around quality content is like you know so in the case of digitonomica for example and we don't we don't need to have talk about this right now but we actually published a policy that we're not going to use this uh generative ai for any actual content creation on our site but that's more of a high bar for like reader trust that we want to keep i wouldn't necessarily say that all publications need to take such a high bar but i do think publications should let readers know how they're using these tools and that's one of the conversations that we still need to have and richard says but never unleash it on a customer unchecked there you go and that's that's the whole essence of these things is that we need to figure out how to do this without screwing the pooch and brent the bro hammer and the cowboy yeah oh, back in the saddle that sounds like that sounds like a drive time radio team the bro hammer and the cowboy we'll be back on the fives with weather and traffic no hey way. hey brent you see my enterprise bs detector logo up there i, I told you i did some cool logos that's one of them. It's kind of small, but I got a I got a few different versions of it that are kind of cool. So I don't know that that's actually the name of the show, but but uh, Enterprise BS Detector, uh, you know that that seems like a a good thing to have handy right about now, wouldn't you say? Um, Brent um, says, uh, <laughs> "Don't hold back, bro. I know who you're referring to." Yeah, I just don't feel like calling this individual and their company out because this is widespread practice. So. Uh, you know, but but I think if you do a little bit of a search, you could pretty easily find it. I'll give you a hint. Search Brent's videos. How's that for a hint? So, John, uh, going back earlier on the deal, I think you'd have better luck creating PowerPoint slides if you dressed like a management consultant. That'll get you in the right framework. Oh, yeah? You, you think need, that would help? You need a tie, a Brooks Brothers suit, and, uh, you know, and some wingtip shoes, and you'll be amazed what will come flowing out. How many two by two matrices you'll knock out? I mean, it'll it'll be it'll go real quick. Well, you know, Brian, I do have a pretty nice tie collection. This may strain strain credibility for you, 
and I actually wore a red tie to the Digitonomica tenure. There's and there's there's proof of this on photos too. Well, so you know, you, you, you would be really, some you'd be so proud, man. You you guys really haven't said much about that event. Um, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get to go, but uh, uh, you know the the news was kind of thin coming out of that. Deal, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, we didn't. We only issued one press release, Brian. Mm-hmm. So um, probably not up to your standards. Like y- you have a pretty like high standard as far as whether an event's newsworthy or not, um, and it definitely was not newsworthy enough uh, for for you, I would say. So I apologize for that. Um, Tracy says you could create a LinkedIn profile with a BS logo in the profile and then throw it up there like you do with our comments. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Anything to beat the link LinkedIn algorithm and make the LinkedIn algorithm work in my favor must be considered. That doesn't turn me into a shill. I just can't do those posts where you tag like 50 or 100 of your friends and colleagues to try to get attention. It just makes me want to vomit. If, if, I, if that's what I have to do to be successful in this industry, then I guess I have to quit today. I really hope I don't have to do that. Anyway. Yeah, that Enterprise BS uh, logo. I- I wonder what my attorney would think of that, given my initials. But anyway, that's just another. Thing. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's Brian Summer. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, like I've that. had people calling BS on my name for all my life. But anyway. oh my gosh! All right, well, I think I think we're out of useful ideas for the day. Thanks all for coming. We'll do it again soon. Appreciate Alrighty. y'all. It- and it's dog feeding time. So thanks Indeed. for having me on, John. Take Laters. care. Appreciate it.